everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and today I am going to be doing my winter reading wrap-up. A slightly funny one. I've kind of been in a reading slump or an on and off slump. It's definitely going incredibly slowly, which is why this is essentially going to cover books from like mid-December to now mid-February. Two whole ass months, eight weeks, and I've only read seven books. And I'm so slow going on further books that if I waited any longer, it would be three months before a wrap ups. Point is, I'm just gonna go over these seven books I read. It's an interesting mix. I had kind of ups and downs that I'm gonna talk about. None of it like really terrible. Like it's not a slump slump slump, but I've definitely had a weird time with reading. Despite having like, I really want to like burn through a bunch of books. I have that urge to like have a good reading streak, you know, that feeling. And it just hasn't been happening. Not because they're bad books, but we're, <laughs> there are some misses here. I'm just gonna dive right in. We're gonna hop in our time machine and go all the way back to two months ago, which is very, very strange. Let's see how much I remember <laughs> about these books. The first one is The Diana Chronicles by Tina Brown nonfiction, of course. And that's the thing. I finished this in December. I started it in November. Like many other people, I watched The Crown season four and was like, I should read a book on Diana. So this is a book on Diana Spencer. And I did pick out, so I, I purposefully read this one instead of say the Andrew Morton book because I wanted to read something written by someone who would have a slightly sharper eye about Princess Diana. I wasn't looking for a sanitized view of Princess Diana, nor a teardown, but I think she's more interesting if you approach her like a real person. And this book definitely delivered on that. The author worked for Tatler, which was like a tabloidy type magazine and a ton of other good legitimate publications, but came up in Britain in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s, working in that newspaper tabloid journalistic world and like rotated in all of those circles. So she had some really interesting insights and mostly it's very well researched. It's very clearly well researched. She mentions a lot of sources. She's very fair when there's speculation. She provides insights like, it can never be definitively said that it was this, but based on XYZ, we think perhaps this. And I appreciate that kind of candor. And it really examines Diana as like a rounded human being. Um, which I appreciated because I don't think she was all sunshine and roses. Like it goes into things like she was vicious toward her stepmother and literally pushed her down the stairs. Interesting. And spec uh, both speculates and presents objective fact as much as humanly possible about, you know, did Diana leak XYZ to the newspapers? And like that kind of stuff is in there, but it still is very properly respectful and thoughtful about her tragic end. I liked it. Pretty scintillating read. You can tell the makers of The Crown Season 4 read it. There were like moments from this. This book is now like 12 years old. It came out in the mid to late 2000s. You can tell that the writers of The Crown read it though because there are scenes where it's like, oh, this that scene from The Crown, very likely sourced from this book. Uh, and I, I, it was a good read. If you were also interested in The Crown Season 4, I do recommend it as a read. Next, I read Local Woman Missing by Mary Kubica. I dove into it because I wanted some wintry, rainy, missing woman vibes, and it definitely delivers on that. This was a really interesting one. So it's all on the theme of missing women, basically, and it jumps between 11 years ago and the present multi-POV, but like most of it is the past working its way forward and there's a ton of different threads. It opens on a woman who is having problems with her husband. She's just had a baby. She's cheating on him and she goes out to meet her affair partner, but then her like little prologue chapter ends with something very ominous and you're like, what happened to this woman? Then you go into the POV of a girl named Delilah, a missing girl who's been kept in a basement. She escapes and like this is in the present and she runs to safety and tells someone who she is and you realize this girl's been missing for 11 years and the next POV is her mother, Meredith. So you already know going in, Delilah the daughter disappeared and has been missing for 11 years. Her mother, Meredith, also disappeared at the same time. Both of them, plus the third woman, three 
disappearances from 11 years ago that are unsolved. Then you also, this is complicated enough, you also get the POV of Kate, who was, is, marry this neighbor. Primarily in the past, so the like dominant POVs are Meredith 11 years ago and Kate 11 years ago. You're getting kind of both sides, Meredith and whatever was happening to her in this build up and you know that something's gonna happen with her and her daughter. And Kate, the neighbor, kind of observing some creepy things going on in the neighborhood. She has her own stuff going on. And then you also get the POV of Leo, who is Meredith's son, but you get him in the present. So you get him as a teenager, his missing sister returned, and the unsolved mystery of, well, what happened to his mother. And that you do get some of Kate in the present eventually, but that's kind of the soup of POV and story. It's a very effective, I mean, I, I'll call it a slow burn thriller in the sense that it is kind of one of those missing women suspense things and it's it, a lot of the tension is derived from we the reader know, I mean, we're literally in Meredith's POV and we know what's gonna happen to her and you're kind of working up to that. You're like, what happened to Meredith the, and Delilah? And what does Kate know? Like, what does Kate see? And it builds and it builds and it builds and it builds and you're trying to piece together how it's all related to that other missing woman and it comes together pretty spectacularly. It's funny because two months later I actually just had to look up some of those specifics but like the things that I had remembered and was trying to poorly explain before I cut that and you got the coherent version. I remembered the stuff with Delilah. I remembered the stuff with Meredith. I remembered kind of, I definitely remember the climax. It sticks in my mind. I remember the mood, tone, and feeling I got reading the book and it had a lot of those like social like stakes derived from like uncomfortable relationships and situations and I was very invested as I read it. It has a lot of different plays on motherhood, keeping up with the Joneses, I mean themes that I already really like. And I gave it four stars because it delivered a really solid reading experience. It really delivered what I was looking for. It's, it's a wintry, rainy, missing woman book. That said, I had some slight issues with some aspects of how it all wrapped up. I ended up giving it a four stars because while well, it delivered the very compelling reading experience and if you similarly like missing women books, you like multi POV, you like dual timeline, you like there being kind of a lot of balls up in the air but you also like those wintry feels. Like there's a lot of rain in this book and I'm just here for that and uh, old houses which I'm also here for. Love a little bit of architecture porn and social stuff. Like in the POV of Meredith, the mom character who we know something bad happens to, I was mostly incredibly invested in her as a character. But some of the other POVs I was just a little less sure about. The teenage son, Leo, his POV is in second person in the sense that, I mean not really, he is referring to his missing sister Delilah. He's describing her return to their home and so his chapters are all like you do this and you do that and it's just a little awkward, a little stilted. There's distance in his POV and it's also like the random teenage boy POV in the book. I was less sold on that. And then Kate's also a tricky character. Like she's not super present in the earlier parts of the book and then she kind of becomes more important later. I, but I was definitely more emotionally invested in Meredith, the mom. And then there are aspects of the big finish that are bonkers in a way. Like I'm both impressed and a little unsure, which is actually also how I felt about the last Mary Kubica book I read last year, The Other Misses. I was impressed, but also slightly unsure. So that's kind of where I landed on it, where I just, you know, I really enjoyed the ride. I'm just not 100% sure it's it completely worked for me, but I love those wintry vibes. Next, I read The Lost Village by Camilla Sten, where I guess I just, I had a run of thrillers I really didn't quite know what to think about or do with. And this was another one. The reading experience was intense. I got sucked into this book. And if you like isolation thrillers, culty stuff, and like basically a thriller with an edge of horror, 
The Lost Village delivers. There was this stretch, it was around Christmas I was reading this, so I remember that, and I was just, I stayed up way too late, one of those classics. I stayed up way too late reading this book and had to make myself stop at 60% because it was like, go to sleep. So the reading experience was excellent. Where I am less sure, I have some issues with some of the specifics in the book, and I do have in my Goodreads review, which I will link to down below, this book uses some tropes. Essentially, the book requires content warnings is the long end of the short of it, and I'm just not sure how I feel about it. It's the kind of one that I think will bug some readers and not bug other readers, and I lean slightly on the side of it bugging me. It also ended up having some logic holes, but let's talk about the setup and the ride. Essentially, it was comped to Midsommar, I think because, I mean, this book is literally Swedish. It's an English translation of a book that came out in Sweden a few years ago and was a big hit. And I can kind of see why, but really I think it's because Midsommar is a sexy Swedish thing. I would comp this to the Blair Witch project. It really delivers like those witchy horror isolation trope documentary vibes like quite literally. It is a very small documentary crew who are traveling to this famous lost village where in 1959 the entire village of 900 people like vanished overnight and the woman who's in charge, Alice, her grandmother was related to people in this village. She was from this village originally, but had moved to Stockholm, which is the reason she didn't disappear in the night. But it's kind of like a family ghost. It is this passion project for Alice. Her grandmother has gone, but this part of her legacy lingers. And so she wants to fund a documentary on this famous lost village. So she gets a small crew, her and four other people, and they travel to the village to take like test footage to put together a Kickstarter campaign to fund their documentary. Documentary. And so it's got all of those delicious isolation thriller slash abandoned place vibes, a, a mood that I really love. You get all of those super satisfying moments of rolling into the town for the first time, walking through the creepy empty streets, poking through houses and seeing what's left, uh, walking through an abandoned school and like, ooh, will the stairs hold us? Like all of that good tropey stuff that you would expect from something like this. And as I said, reading experience wise, this book delivers. I was constantly guessing it had, is it supernatural vibes in that sense, like not literally gothic, but it's that same thing you're gonna get out of a gothic horror of the, is this this or is there a logical explanation? Which is why it really feels Blair Witchy to me. Uh, it delivers on all of that incredibly well. Because you are cutting back and forth between the present as they are going through this creepy abandoned village and the past from the POV of Elsa, who was Alice's great-grandmother, keeping track of the family ties. Basically, Alice's grandmother, her mother kept a diary, and you get her diary in kind of the last, like, couple months of the village before the thing happened. And so you're getting from her diary entries, like, this really, like, slow, creeping crawl of, like, a new priest comes into town and some people start acting funny, and I mentioned culty vibes, so there are culty vibes. And you're trying to be like, what is going on in this village and how did it how does it impact like what happened and what's happening in the present because you're like was there something demony going on it's that hint of supernatural thing so all of that is built pretty exquisitely and yes eventually shit starts going down it delivers all of those isolation trope things that you you about someone dies and it starts becoming about like who's going to be the next to die so it delivers on all of that. Now to discuss kind of my f overall feelings and where I have reservations and the content warnings, I do need to talk about spoilers. Before I talk about spoilers, I will leave it as the book, it gets very soapy at the end and it expects us to accept as an explanation something that I find has a lot of logic holes and doesn't quite hold up for me, but also it devolves into some aspects of horror and tropes that I'm just not super comfortable with, but it is going to vary reader to reader. So I'm going to start with the content warning and then kind of get into spoilers and 
so you, you can determine whether you want to watch the content warning. The content warnings have to do with ableism and mental health. So I'll start with the content warning, then I'll talk spoilers. So starting with the content warning, you do know up front pretty early in the book. When the village was abandoned, the only two things they found were a woman who had been stoned to death and a live baby. So part of the mystery, I should have said in the previous section, but oh well, is who is the baby? So that's an aspect of it. And the woman who was stoned to death, you realize through, they mention it in the present and it's also in Elsa's diary from the past, you understand who this character is. She is a character named Brigida and it is made incredibly clear, Brigida is disabled. It's unclear exactly what her condition is, but the person in the present observes that modern medicine would very likely diagnose this character with autism, but at the time they wouldn't have had kind of that terminology. In the past, you get lots of description. Brigida is primarily nonverbal, not completely nonverbal, but primarily nonverbal, does live on her own, but Elsa, the great grandmother character, after Brigida's mother died, she checks in on her every single day she brings her food she brings her the same food every day and if anything in her routine changes Brigida can go into wild fits mostly causing harm to herself but occasionally because she's a grown woman and stronger than she realizes can harm others she's described as what we would term stimming in modern terminology and in the past section of course they don't and Obviously we know that she ends up dying and so you're not going to be surprised that a major part of the plot line in the past and related to the present is this woman dying incredibly horribly. And uh, okay, so that's the content warning that I will say. While the book approaches it with empathy in the sense that our POV characters are deeply empathetic toward the character, as it should be, Elsa really cares about this character, this woman, this person, and the character in the present, Alice, is also deeply empathetic to this horrible thing that happened to this woman. It's still a piece of work that is choosing to use the trope of the severely disabled person who is called the devil by people in town who's pursued relentlessly, is essentially tortured and murdered. Plus, this is a content warning and a spoiler, part of the plot line. This is like full on a spoiler, but it's also a content warning. You did realize Brigida was raped and the baby found in the village was her baby. And so it's that, I, I personally err on the side of, I don't care how empathetically you write it, and I know that this is a thing that happens, but I didn't really want to read about this poor woman being raped, having a baby, and then being murdered. And that's why, I mean, I just couldn't unabashedly love this book. The content warning is also partly why I didn't enjoy reading that. <laughs> I just personally don't need my horror slash suspense slash, slash thriller with a side of horrible things happening to helpless people. I know everyone's gonna have a different barometer. So the second half of the, the content warning slash spoiler warning, it's more content warning. Mental health is also a major part of the book. It's mostly dealt with sensitively, but the thing is no matter how sensitively you deal with it, meaning there is a character who may or may not be having a psychotic break and there are the POV character is empathetic toward this character and defensive of this character but the other characters are like she's crazy and is murdering us. That is what's going on. So that is a part of the plot device. And it also, there's a whole backstory between two characters about one attempting suicide and it impacting their relationship. So all of that is in there and it's managed more very empathetically, but I know that for some readers that's still going to be a flat out no. They just don't want to read a book where the question of whether someone is psychotic and is thus a killer is a part of the book. So that that is just a really valid content warning for this book. It it is a horror that is definitely leaning very heavily on the topics of mental health and disability. Now, that is all kind of like a reason why this book just didn't land for me. I ended up giving it four stars on Goodreads and not saying specifically what my star rating is, but as I've kind of chewed on it longer, it's been almost, it's been like six weeks. 
I think it's ultimately probably a 3.5 that I'm generously rounding up. And that brings us to the further spoilery reasons why this just didn't quite land for me. It's It really sucks because I loved the reading experience of it, but I still, you know, you you can finish a book that you in technically enjoyed reading and just be kind of like, you sit in your, your feelings a bit. Eh. So this is where I landed. First of all, yeah, the, the, everything with Brigida bothered me on multiple levels. The mental health didn't like bother me bother me except I still just I still side-eyed it I mean essentially the reason the mental the mental health stuff gave way to this other thing with Brigida like oh yay we traded one thing that I wasn't sure about for a thing I definitely didn't particularly love but let's talk about the actual twist of the book and the spoilers which is the real reason it kind of fell apart for me the logic holes the logicals, and I just want to say them for posterity. I put them in my Goodreads review for posterity because I just want to like make my feelings be known. I have, I get what the book was doing, but I have serious trouble believing it. While it was thrilling, a lovely little third act, I'm just over here where I, I like, these are my questions. So don't watch this section, obviously, unless you've read it or you don't care about spoilers. So we find out, so in, very important, in the past POV, Elsa, I believe that's her name. If I said her name wrong the whole time, that's hilarious. Her, she's very concerned about her daughter, Ina. Her elder daughter, who is Alice's grandmother, is in Stockholm, and she's writing to her and like telling her what's going on. Well, Ina is 14 years old, and Ina becomes incredibly enamored of the new priest, the new pastor who joins the church, who takes over from the previous older pastor who's a drunkard. And he's hot and young and charismatic, and essentially new pastor starts a cult. He starts, he, he gets all of the people in town. The book really wants us to believe that over the course of approximately nine months, why yes, the length of a pregnancy, why do you ask? Uh, that this charismatic young pastor convinced 900 people, 900, that's a lot of people, to follow him and turn on the, well, basically turn on the only two people in the village who weren't down with that, the Elsa and Birgitta, the person who was the object of their ire, the whole ass village. I'm like, Okay, and nothing supernatural was going on. It, it, I mean, I guess it was normal brainwashing. So we're meant to believe the pastor runs a, a god cult. 14-year-old Ina is like super down with that. Pastor is an evil sociopath. He raped Brigida, and he basically gets the whole town to turn on her to cover the fact that he got her pregnant and she's had a baby. He calls her the devil. He calls out the child as like a product of say Like all of that. It's culty. It's culty. Well... The, uh, I forgot to mention it's a mining town. They're abandoned mines. And so everyone in this town disappears in 1959. And allegedly, like, they tried to find these people. It's part of the lore. And they looked in the woods. But we're also, it's also mentioned they never dragged the lake. There's a lake. And you're like, okay, that's weird. Another place they didn't check. In a mining town where the mines had been shut down, they never checked the mines. And I'm just sitting over here like, did you even try Sweden in, this, in the 60s? Did you even try to find the missing residents of this village? Because I think you did it. And that's the thing. I think the plot twist is both too easy and difficult to believe because it turns out Ina is the sole survivor of the village. 900 ass people went down into the mines because crazy pastor led them down there to murder the, the great grandma Elsa, to murder them. And also the whole town was just fine with ritualistic murder, which cool. Um, and the mine collapsed, killing everyone except for Ina because he had sent her out from the mines to go check on the baby. And so Ina, who was, remember, 14 and dead ass in love with hot sociopathic pastor, just chills in the village for 60 years. Just chills in the village for 60 years. She like lives in the different houses and eats the food and runs through the woods because she's basically had a psych, I mean, it has to be a psychotic break. Ina is still cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and by cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, I mean cuckoo for hot, sexy, sociopathic pastor. So she's in her 70s, she's in her mid to late 70s. She is creeping around this town. She's been murdering the entire documentary crew. And she's like, I'm waiting for them. They're coming back for me. I have to stay here. And I'm like, I don't believe this. 
I don't believe that she was just chilling for 60 years, that she would have survived for 60 years. She was a normal 14 year old girl, with poor judgment mind you, but she wasn't described as having any particular hunting skills, survival skills, and I'm, I don't think she would be alive, but also she's like dead ass 74, 75 years old and we're meant to believe that she has the strength to murder for three people, like really horrifically murder them, like murder them in a way that would require a substantial amount of strength. And there's also this scene that I still don't understand. Uh, there's a bomb and a truck and, and the main Alice climbs into the truck and it's like she's in the truck with like a supernatural creature. Like she describes it as like it's skittering on the other side and I'm like, you are telling me this 75 year old woman was in this blown up turnover truck like in the dark creeping her out no that doesn't make any sense like it doesn't and the book is not supernatural if you told me like Ina developed like creepy witch superpowers like maybe but this is not actually a speculative book it makes no sense and I don't believe it and so it basically fell apart for me at the end because on the one hand I'm like oh wow that's really really gross what you did to Brigida I'm just not a fan of that and on the other hand I'm like the logic holes ruined the book for me personally. It just ascends to a level of horror cheese that I can't get on board with. So now I've just vomited spoilers on your 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 back here because uh, I should say I I did give it four stars. I gave it four stars on Goodreads because it delivered a good reading experience. Even though I didn't love it ultimately in the end, it was such a good reading experience. But really, I'd say this is for me, if, if you're, you've been here long enough, you know when I give something a 3.5, I'm still gonna usually generously round up, but a 3.5 for me really means something didn't land, and so you skipped the spoiler section if you're here, or if you didn't, you know. Yeah, it's ultimately, I think it's, it's, the, it's a combination of logic holes in the twist and the ableism, where I just, it cannot be higher than a 3.5 generously routed up to a four for me. Now, if you are an isolation trope horror fan, you might still love this. And the things that bothered me might not bother you, but personally for me, logic holes kill it every single time. Next, I read When the Stars Go Dark by Paula McLean, which was great. And I haven't really talked about the reading slump part yet. <laughs> so to give you an idea, so I'm talking about this book next, but technically the ones after it, I finished first. <laughs> but I started this book in late December and I finished it in late January. Essentially, I've really struggled with fiction. Ever since I read Local Woman Missing and Lost Village, I struggle with fiction, not because the fiction was bad. So When the Stars Go Dark by Paula McLean is a beautiful literary suspense. It is upmarket. It is definitely not your typical commercial thriller. It is not a fast zippy read, but I really enjoyed reading it. So I ended up taking my time with it. When the stars go dark, so it is set in Northern California. It follows a woman detective whose specialty is missing girls and missing children. But that has really taken a toll on her. She's definitely a, she's a character who's definitely experienced a lot of trauma and part of her traumatic background is definitely a part of the book. It's very character driven, though also like theme and idea driven in the sense that uh, it tackles things like sexual assault, the foster system, um, and missing, missing girls. And what is so interesting about it, and it really threw me off at first and a couple times after that, but I'm not mad about it, the book is set in 1993, I think. It's set in the 90s. And like the first time I came across that reference because it mentioned the Clinton administration, I was like, okay. Um, so the reason for this is, well, it becomes clear later in another instance of really kind of throwing me off, but it's still, it's a very interesting execution. Um, Polly Class, who is a young woman in California, a young girl in California who was abducted from her home and murdered and is quite famous uh, from that and, in the wake of that, her her father, her parents established uh, a foundation that helps find missing children. But that case is a plot point in this book, and I was really thrown at first because it's set in kind of the same region where Polyclass really was abducted. 
abducted and taken. Uh, and in the course of the fictional story of the book, uh, which is the daughter, uh, the adopted daughter of a celebrity in this town uh, in Mendocino going missing, uh, the police detective and her, her partner uh, end up also poking into the Polly class case. And it was just very strange. But it's all wrapped up in the theme of forgotten girls, neglected girls, uh, the types of young women who are vulnerable to predators, um, the psychic damage on the people who investigate these things, guilt from the parents, and also the complexity that the missing girl had been adopted and the main character was a foster child. Um, and that's a huge part of her character. And honestly, like, so that's the thing I like the best about it. It wasn't so much a book where I was like, who did it, who did it, who did it, where's this girl? Though I cared a lot about the girl who was missing, and as you learn more about her, I wanted her to be okay, as did the detective. But it's really not that kind of book. And I will say, when I got to the who done it part, I was like, yeah, duh. I, that was actually one of my first guesses at the earlier part of the book. I wasn't surprised at all. I can't believe the detective was surprised, but it's not the kind of thriller where you're reading for that. It's about everything else. It is upmarket, it is character driven. So some lines in this book were so freaking gorgeous, I had to like stop and go, wow. You know, I definitely had a couple moments of like, I'll never write like this. And then I get to the end of the book. I'm like, oh, the author is a poet <laughs> as well as um, writing fiction. I was like, <laughs> so it's very beautifully written. So if you do like to have your kind of thrillers be incredibly character driven, to be incredibly beautifully written and really kind of be dense and themey, kind of, uh, this is a very good book. I, I thought the, the stuff, the plot lines with the, with the foster care system and the main character, I thought it was really beautiful. Like you get flashbacks in the past because she's basically returning to her, her hometown, Mendocino, which was her longest foster placement before she turned 18. Um, and you just get the snippets of like how that foster family like loved her and like kind of how she developed as a person through this the longest placement she never got adopted. How her foster dad had taught her survival skills and how it helped her investigate cases. Like there's just lots of like beautiful like character moments. There's a dog and the dog's okay. That's a good spoiler. Nothing happens to the dog. The dog does not die. And I loved the dog, Cricket. Cricket's a character and Cricket's great. And so it has that vibe of like this, this main character with a lot of psychic damage, like a lot of stuff that she's carrying, healing and trying to move forward through this case. And I normally don't read those kinds of books, but had the vibe I wanted because you know it's the same reason I read Local Woman Missing. I wanted a wintry vibe and this book definitely delivered a wintry vibe though it's coming out in spring. That's what's so funny um and and Local Woman Missing is coming out in May. I'm like oh all these books I read for winter vibes are coming out in the spring and summer um but yeah so I really liked it. It took me a month to read it which is unusual for me but I'm not mad about it. But it's definitely a very particular kind of read. Um, don't go into it if you're looking for like breakneck thriller pace. So one of the reasons it took me so long to read this is I had to take a break to read The Magic Words by Cheryl Klein because I was doing the live show with Laura and Kevin for the craft book, uh, book chat. And so the initial reason I put When the Stars Go Dark to the side was to read this for the live show. It is an excellent craft book if you're writing for kids, basically kid lit, young adult fiction, middle grade fiction. If you are kind of newer and or you're someone who really loves brainstorming and writing exercises, it's a craft book. First of all, it very well kind of goes over what kid lit is, like what YA middle grade are. We as the craft book chat did have some issues, like it's a little dated parts of it. Some of the references are dated and you know, it, it goes really hard on certain references that were, we were less enthused about, but overall it's a really good primer and it has 
excellent, excellent brainstorming and writing exercises. So if you want like a practical craft book that's gonna give that to you, definitely The Magic Words by Cheryl Klein. Like, I think that if you are more advanced in the sense that you are very well read in young adult, you've written young adult, there's not a lot that's new that you're going to find in it. But at the same time, what's interesting about reading some of these craft books for me for the Craft Chat Book Club, good and bad, is that it can be illuminating reading how someone else phrases something or they put to words something that you felt in your bones. So that was kind of nice. There were a couple like ways that she expressed things that were kind of like, ah, for me. But definitely if you are newer, if you are further on the aspiring end, you're trying to figure this out and you are interested in writing middle grade YA, definitely read the magic words, asterisk. That said, it's ideal for what I would call pure YA or classic YA. As you may know, YA is a weird freaking category. We have so much upper YA now, crossover YA, the nebulousness of new adult is still not a thing, but YA is publishing books that you would maybe call it that if it were a thing. This book's not really gonna help you with that part of the current YA market, edging up into upper YA as much. The basics will still apply, but the majority of the examples, just because of when it was written and when Cheryl Klein was working for Scholastic specifically, it's very much rooted in almost a previous era of young adult fiction, but definitely if you're writing middle grade, I, like, I don't know a ton about middle grade and I found those sections, especially when she gives examples of like kind of different approaches and voice, really, really good. Next, I did a reread actually. I just had this hank hankering to read The Psychopath Test again, a book I have read. I read it years ago by John Ronson, so I already knew that I liked it. And it was one of those things where like I could have sworn I owned a copy and I looked everywhere in my apartment and couldn't find it. So. I bought a, another one. I mean, clearly it's not in this apartment, so I bought a copy of it and I reread it. And what was interesting, so as a primer, John Ronson is a journalist. He's kind of like a, he's an investigative journalist, but more of like a, a quirky storyteller <laughs> investigative journalist. He like will like follow a weird quirky story and then follow lots of threads because he's a working journalist in the UK and then compile them into books. So The Psychopath Test is one of his books. He also had one, The Men Who Stare at Goats, which was about this like psychic program in I think the CIA or something and that was turned into a movie which is why it might sound familiar. Um, his, uh, actually the only one I haven't read, I just haven't gotten to it yet, he wrote uh, So You've Been Publicly Shamed more recently about, uh, I mean, cancel culture, except because it was published years ago, it's really not in step with the current kind of world of the internet. But like, that's the kind of like, he, he, he investigates interesting social phenomena. So this one, it's interesting. So when I read it, when it came out, which I was, seven or eight years ago. I loved it. I gave it five stars on Goodreads. I definitely read it. Um, and it, there are still things in it that are super illuminating. So he has several intimate encounters with various types of alleged possible psychopaths. They're not diagnosed and he's careful to point that out, but he basically, he, he runs them through some points of the psychopath test, uh, which is the hair checklist. And some of the responses he gets from some of the people that he interviews are indeed quite chilling and instructive. Uh, he interviews a convicted mass murderer, <laughs> like, you know, lead firing squads in another country murdered lots of people guy. And the way that he talks, I mean, I won't spoil it if you want to read it, but the way that he talks about his like personal philosophy, really interesting stuff. Um, he in interviews uh, a, a guy who used to run, uh, do like corporate stuff. He ran Sunbeam for a while to kind of poke into corporate sociopathy. And in a good way, he doesn't draw concrete conclusions about any of these people. And so there's just lots of interesting portraits, but rereading it, I'd forgotten parts of it. The things that stuck with me were the interviews that I found the most interesting, which were the, where he was looking more at antisocial personality disorder and his interactions with hair and like kind of talking to industry professionals. That part, very interesting. 
but technically the book starts off and there is a running theme and there are times when I just feel that it kind of misses its own plot. Technically the book is about mental illness. Technically, like he called it the psychopath test, but the subtitle of the book is A Journey Through the Madness Industry. And that's where I feel it's weaker in some parts. I've forgotten so much about it. Like it actually opens on um, these scientists all received this mysterious book and him trying to like track down what crazy person must have produced this book. And like, especially reading it now in 2021, um, I'm not describing it well, but it's this very weird thing. Um, it's like a custom printed, it has like holes in specific pages and it was mailed with a cryptic note to like 200 people. It's something like that. But he, he does manage to track down the person who did this. And the read I get on it is that the person is most likely neurodivergent. Um, and that's not something that he explores, but like reading, I'm like, oh, so this, this person's definitely quirky. And in fairness, John doesn't like paint him with this horrible brush or call him crazy. He also kind of takes, does the takeaway of this guy's quirky and he did something strange, but it's just, it's a weird frame device for the whole book and then he also attempts to go down some rabbit holes with other aspects of he calls it the madness industry and mental health like he very briefly touches on postpartum psychosis but barely and I'm just and he talks about the DSM-5 and actually like the history of the DSM which was definitely interesting but meaning it definitely feels like it, the book was cobbled together with different reporting than he did because that's how these books come about and some of the connective tissue in parts of the book feels hastily added. Um, the book I think could have like I gave it four stars the second time around because I didn't like those parts of the book. So there are chapters of the book that are misses basically because they're just kind of eh. He, he talks about things but it doesn't get deep. And I just am kind of like shrug emoji. I mean, the madness industry is interesting. Like he he interviews uh, Scientologists who notoriously hate it. Um, but yeah, I just, it skims depths at certain points and it's just kind of shrug emoji for me. But the parts about antisocial personality disorder remain pretty riveting stuff. So last and honestly, for once least of this wrap up, the final book is one that really didn't land for me, which if you're familiar with my reading wrap ups is pretty rare. I usually have a pretty good sense. I'm a mood reader, first of all, I pick things I'm in the mood to read and I have a pretty good sense based on cover copy, what I'm probably going to like. So this one honestly surprised me at how much it just didn't land for me. And I hate to like say that I d it just didn't work for me, and there are some things in it that are okay, but generally speaking, The Last Resort by Susie Holiday. So it's set up and presented as a classic isolation trope thriller with like rich assholes and secrets. So like, you know, that's merging tropes that I really, really like. It's pitched as a bunch of strangers are tempted to this luxury island for uh, to test some new technology. So luxury getaway, new technology. But then when they arrive, they discover that secrets are afoot and they are in danger. And the cover copy specifically indicates that it's like a fight for survival. It even has the word of perfect crime, which having read it now, I'm like, what does that mean? Because I disagree. And that's the thing. I was expecting a classic isolation trope thriller, like, and then there were none, but with rich idiots on a luxury resort with technology, almost like the Fantasy Island movie reboot, but good. And it did give me some vibes of that movie, except unfortunately a little too similar to that movie. It failed in similar ways, but different. <laughs> if you've seen that movie, you understand what I mean. And the, the, the best way to describe it is the pacing, uh, the way that it kind of plays with the tropes is not what I was expecting. It, 
it just didn't quite work for me. Now the writing itself, I liked the writing itself in the sense that I liked a lot of the character work, I found parts of it kind of caustically funny, everyone was interestingly drawn, and I was at the beginning, like act one is really compelling. This group of strangers, they're on a little airplane and then they think it's crashing and they wake up on this island totally fine. They're introduced like, oh, your host will see you tonight at a party and they have to uh, test this, this technology. And it's technology that literally like goes into their brain and accesses their neural network. Now, a huge part of the tension with the characters is this debate of like, oh, it's not doing that. It's definitely not accessing our memories and playing them for other people. And the thing is that got old really fast because yes, it's obviously doing that. And that was one point where this is way more speculative, like fantasy sci-fi than I was expecting because it takes place now. And I think what kind of added to like the weirdness for me was you go between multi POV of the people on the island now going through everything and the year 2000 and the POV from the year 2000, it's a little girl, you know that, but you don't know her real name and it's her and another child and they're on an island that is similar to the one that they're on and they semi-accidentally kill someone is kind of the past chapter and that's like the first flashback in the year 2000. But it means that you know one of the people on the island is that child and someone else on the island is probably the other child in the flashback and this is one of their secrets so that's you know that they each have a secret i will say i thought it was really clearly telegraphed who it was uh th there wasn't a ton of tension and suspense in that but because i'm like i mean i know the year 2000 i'm not that old i guess i i'm old enough to remember the year 2000 and i'm just kind of like squinting like so this takes place now but it has this wacky future technology and it it, it it's the kind of thing where in Black Mirror, and it had Black Mirror vibes, it works because you know that it's five minutes in the future or 10 minutes in the future, but this book is not five minutes in the future or 10 minutes in the future, it's now. And I'm not gonna go into spoilers for the twist except to say that I was reading on expecting, okay, I'm sure this is all gonna come together and I'm gonna get to the big reveal. Who's the host? Who's behind this company? Why have all these people been brought together? And it's going to make sense, but it never quite satisfyingly came together for me as a reader. It's a little hand wavy about the whole technology aspect of it. And also because the technology aspect is a major part of the storytelling and the tension, you do get wide swaths of the novel where the primary tension is all the characters are having a memory video broadcast in front of them. And so part of the conceit is one of the characters, her neural implant doesn't work. And so she just gets a watch. And so you'll literally have sections where characters have to describe to her what they're seeing. And it's, it's just, it's the kind of thing that would be really, really cool in a movie, a visual that would be great in a movie. But in the book, it adds a layer of passivity and distance that isn't optimal in a tightly paced thriller. And about the thriller pacing, that's that's the other thing where it just wasn't what I was expecting. So if you're gonna read this, you have to go into this knowing this. And I, I guess I wish I did. Ugh, it's hard, it, it's a semi-spoiler, but okay, it's a thriller. You know that people are gonna die. Semi-spoiler though is, pacing wise, the death stuff doesn't happen to the very end of the book. So pacing wise, what you would normally expect from an isolation thriller, at least by the break into two, the first third, you expect to find your first body and you expect that to be part of the ticking clock of danger and that doesn't happen. So what it means is that for two thirds of the book, the source of the ticking clock tension is this nebulous unease and it's all about memory secrets but it's not actually like the characters themselves do not realize the high stakes of the situation even though as a reader there are certainly hints there that you know it's probably not going to turn out okay for several people but for me i really needed the characters to have that turn moment far sooner. I needed real stakes. The book kept teasing us like this person might be dead or something fatal might be happening and then it pulled back from it and I just I didn't that 
pulling back on the tension was a real bummer for me. So ultimately for me, pacing wise, it just felt uneven. And then the climax is a banger, but not for me a banger in a good way. It's bonkers and I'm not entirely sure it holds together. It certainly didn't hold together for me. It wasn't satisfying for me. It, it, as I mentioned, I was hoping and assuming that in hindsight it would make a lot of things come together and make sense, but it actually made it more confusing and less satisfying. And as I sit here thinking about it, like I'm, you always want to be like, oh yes, the antagonist plan totally made sense and these are the steps and I cannot tell you that. And thus, it just didn't work for me. So, uh, yeah. So honestly, if you are a fan of isolation thrillers, I cannot recommend this as a satisfying isolation thriller because it just doesn't do what a satisfying isolation thriller does. However, if you are more a fan on the speculative, uh, fantastical technology side, and you're a little less fussed with some of the like kind of <laughs> Five minutes in the future, except it's not in the future, logic stuff, you might find it more satisfying because it definitely delivers on that. And the characters do have pretty juicy secrets, but for me personally, it just didn't land in terms of tension, pacing, and kind of the big climactic ending slash solution. So it was quite a place to end. <laughs> my reading on I, I can happily report I am currently like 60% of the way through a very good thriller. I didn't finish it in time for this wrap up so I will leave you in suspense but I did after this one I took a break from reading like four or five days I'm telling you it's an on and off slump and then I very pointedly picked a book from my TBR where I was like I know 100% this author is not going to disappoint me and I will finish this book in two to three days. So that's kind of where I am now. What a mixed bag of books. But I am, I am really hopeful that I will break this so-called slump. It's mostly that I want to get on a string of like reading fiction, specifically thrillers. I have so many good thrillers on my TBR, but I'm such a mood reader that the sump has really been that I haven't been in the proper mood to read the books that I do have. So please give me your best thoughts. Send me your good book reader energy. Let me know down below in the comments if you've read any of these and give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and I will continue to do my reading wrap ups. As always guys, thank you so much for watching and happy reading.